Good evening and welcome to the Spirit and Life Bible Study. My name is Jonathan. Our reader is Cara tonight. Very good to be back with you, good friends. And we're talking about, our title tonight is The Laver and Purification. The laver being a two-layered bowl in which the priests in the Old Testament would wash, either before they went and attended a meeting or before they did sacrifices. And so we want to talk about this and purification. And one of the questions that we're pondering, Swedenborg says that we have a multi-leveled, we are a multi-leveled entity. And uh, our higher self is one thing and our lower self is another thing. And he explains that our lower self is not just our, our body, our actions and our words, but there's a part of our mind that's more outward than, than another part that's more inward. And so the question tonight is how do you cleanse your mind? Have you ever done something that you regretted and then you, you wish you could erase it or do something about it? Whatever? How, do you, how do you get rid of that thing? And uh, is there a way to cleanse your outer self? Is there a way to cleanse your inner self? And the labor has something to do with a biblical answer to this. So if you're willing to join us, let's, uh, let's do that tonight. Shall we, friends? Let's open with a prayer. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, you are the one God of heaven and earth. We pray, Lord, that you come down and be among us as we're opening the pages of your word. Explain this symbolism in the Bible to us and show us what it has to do with our lives, our daily lives, how we can be closer to you, Lord. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Sending out love to those of you online and on the phone and getting the podcast. Such a pleasure to be back with you again. Uh, we, as some of you know, had to cancel last week and then we had to cancel the week before. I don't know whether preparing for this thing three times has made it better or worse, but we'll see how it, how it goes. But um, so let's look at this diagram. Those of you who are getting the visuals, I've used this for the last number of weeks. Um, there was a tent of meeting in the center. This is the tabernacle in the Old Testament. And just outside it, there was this laver. This, it's all I've represented here is by a circle. And that was between the tent of meeting and the altar for uh, burnt offerings and sacrifices and so on. So the laver is what we're talking about tonight. And uh, let's jump into Exodus chapter 30 and read a description of this thing. Compared to some of the other features of the tabernacle, we're not really told much about it. We're really told more about what its purpose is, but not the description of it. So let's read Exodus 30 and start at verse 17. Okay. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, You shall also make a laver of bronze. Bronze. Okay, this is going to be made out of bronze. Now, uh, if you're aware of the tabernacle or were tuning in in previous weeks, everything that was inside the tent of meeting was gold, 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 wasn't it? Just gold, gold, gold. Out here, we're, we're bronze, and, and that's interesting. There's a difference there. Go on. Uh, with its base also of bronze for washing. Ah, that's what it's for. See, that's, that's right up front. <coughs> it's for washing. Laver it comes from a word meaning to wash. Laver les mains, right? Go on. <laughs> you shall put it between the tabernacle of meeting and the altar, and you shall put water in it. Aha, uh -huh. water, okay. For Aaron and his sons shall wash their hands and their feet in water from it. Okay, so people have pictured that this is two basins, really. One basin for the hands, one basin for the feet. I went to uh, a public high school up in Canada for a couple of years, and they had exactly this, you know, a kind of thing that you would step on, had water on these two levels and so forth. And... Um, so this is what it was like for washing the hands and the feet. Okay, go on. When they go into the tabernacle of meeting, or when they come near the altar to minister, to burn an offering made by fire to the Lord, they shall wash with water, lest they die. Oh, go on. So they shall wash their hands and their feet, lest they die. And it shall be a statute forever to them 
to him and his descendants throughout their generations. That's it. No, you know, some of the other descriptions are like, oh, there's, this is carved on the outside or that's made with this or there's seven of the, you know, the, the description of the lampstand we were looking at uh, was, you know, very detailed about how everything, this just says, just make a labor. It's for washing feet and hands, that's it. And the purpose of it seems to be the main thing that's communicated. But there is one additional detail, and you notice there that it's on pain of death. And I think one reason I'd been pondering a few weeks ago, because at first I had misunderstood and thought the labor was farther away than the altar. I think one reason, one simple reason that it's in between the altar and the tent of meeting is that they're to wash when they go to either place. Like it's convenient to both you know, whether you're going this way and going into the tent of meeting or this way to do a sacrifice, they're supposed to wash. So that would be kind of a reminder there in either case. Now, there's a little detail here. Look at Exodus chapter 38 that was not mentioned there, but it comes up later when the thing is actually made. 38 verse 8. This is very intriguing to me. He made the laver of bronze and its base of bronze from the bronze mirrors of the serving women who assembled at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Weird. This thing was made of mirrors. It was made of mirrors. It specifically, now they weren't instructed to make it of mirrors, but it just, when you get to the fact when they make it, what did he make it out? Where, where was the bronze from? Well, you can picture, can't you, sort of a Bronze Age mirror that, you know, it may not be the most perfect reflection or whatever, but you've got a, a mirror there, kind of a looking glass. And, um, and that's what he made it out of. And, and who were these women? So you say that again? The serving women who assembled at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Hmm. Serving. serving women. Serving women's mirrors probably meaningless. <laughs> what do you say? No? No? Oh, I, I, it's not meaningless. There, there's definitely a meaning to that. Okay, now I want you to skip from there all the way to the New Testament for just one second. And let's go to, okay. You know the four Gospels, right? And Acts, and then you know the book of Revelation all the way at the right hand end. About halfway between there is Hebrews. And if you go to the right from Hebrews, you get to James. Or if you want to back up from the book of Revelation, you can quite easily get there too. James is to the left of Peter, it's to the right of Hebrews. Because when it mentioned those mirrors, mirrors don't come up a whole ton in Scripture. You know, there's not a whole lot of mirrors in there. But here is a passage about mirrors that I thought was very interesting because it seems to be about some kind of spiritual cleansing. Um, oh, we might as well begin at verse 19 because it's so good. Of chapter 1 of James. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. This is not a bad verse to commit to memory. You, you get what it's saying there? Quick to listen, right? Quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. And this next glorious verse here. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. You would think it would. <laughs> you? you would think your temper tantrum would sort of be some kind of divine force in the world. But strangely, it's not. <laughs> yeah. It, you, our wrath does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, what should we do? Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness. Mm and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. Mm, go on. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. Oh, there's a mirror. So you're like someone looking at your natural, like your physical face, you know, looking at your face in a mirror. And what happens? For he observes himself 
goes away and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. <laughs> I've never done that. But um, <laughs> you, you look in the mirror, you might get a moment of insight, and then you walk away and just you know, wipe it from your mind. And don't think about what kind of person you saw in the mirror. It's an amazing kind of uh, statement, isn't it? And right after pleading with us to lay aside our, our bad habits, our wickedness, and that sort of thing, and it goes on there in the next few verses about good advice on what sort of person to be. So, so doesn't it make the mirror kind of a spiritual thing if it's saying that you're looking at yourself in the mirror and you immediately, as soon as you walk away, you forget what sort of person you are. So it seems like this mirror has something to do with self-examination, right? Looking in the mirror to try to see what kind of person you are. Here's a laver for washing and it's literally made of mirrors. It's, it's, it's kind, of, kind of amazing to me. Okay, let's flip back to Exodus, shall we? All the way back to the second book of the Bible on the left. And let's go to Exodus chapter 40. I just wanted to get that mirror passage in there to get our thinking going. And in Exodus 40, we hear a little bit here, uh, starting in verse 6. This is where it all comes together and the tabernacle gets set up and everything. Then you shall set the altar of the burnt offering before the door of the tabernacle of the tent of meeting. And you shall set the laver there be it is. between the tabernacle of meeting and the altar mm. and put water in it. Yes, the water is an important ingredient. Okay. You shall set up the court all around and hang up the screen at the court gate. Yes, and it goes on about the anointing <coughs> oil and so on. And look at verse 11. And you shall anoint the laver and its base and consecrate it. It always separates the laver from the base, which is interesting. It has a base, and the laver and the base, and consecrate it. Go on. Then you shall bring Aaron and his sons to the door of the tabernacle of meeting and wash them with water. Okay, there, there it is. So there's a, there's a ceremonial washing that takes place, and then they put on these priestly garments. And look over at verse 30. He set the laver between the tabernacle of meeting and the altar and put water there for washing. Yes, and you probably don't need to keep repeating the water and the washing and washing. And in fact, it used water, uh, but it's meaningful in the inner meaning why it's water and so on. Let's go. And Moses, Aaron and his sons would wash their hands and their feet with water from it. Whenever they went into the tabernacle of meeting and when they came near the altar, they washed. Yes, so the tent, tent of meeting would be one way, the altar was the other way, but either one, they would wash. Okay. As the Lord had commanded Moses. Are we still going? No, I think oh, okay. we can We're stop done. there, but that's, that's the finishing of the whole process of setting up the tabernacle. Okay, now, so there's a picture that the priests would wash there and wash their hands and wash their feet. So, I was thinking originally when I started studying this topic that I thought, well, obviously that labor means something having to do with repentance, my favorite thing, and uh, because you're, you're washing before you do these sacrifices and so on. So it's got something to do with repentance. Swedenborg, interestingly, says it does not have to do with repentance. Hmm. Interesting. Um, mm -hmm. he, he gives another explanation, which I'll get into in a bit. But I wanted to look also at the point. See, there it was Moses and Aaron, they washed their hands and their feet. Then you have various passages in Scripture that talk about washing, and it's very interesting that they seem to me kind of divided between whether the Lord washes us or we wash ourselves. And you can find passages that, that go both ways. Let's look at a few of those. Can you find in the middle of your, let's go to the middle and find the Psalms, middle of your Bible, and then go to the left and go to Job. Job chapter 9. I should get a big turn signal back here, or something, you know, you know, that'd be great for <laughs> left and right. And um, Job chapter 9, verses 30 and 31. Hmm. Let's start at 29 now. If I am condemned, why then do I labor in vain? Hmm. If I wash myself with snow water, 
and cleanse my hands with soap, yet you will plunge me into the pit and my own clothes will abhor me. Yes, it's interesting in the context he's talking about, really it is sort of a spiritual cleansing. Job is going through a very difficult time, as you may know. And it's an interesting statement that if he washes himself with snow water, cleanses himself with soap, uh, it, it, yet he'll still be plunged into the pit and his own clothes shall loathe him. Turn over to Job 15, which is a passage that's been very striking to me. And I love the way when you get scriptures loaded in your head and then you're looking through a different angle and then you come across the same scriptures and you see something different in them. Look at verse 14 in Job 15. What is a man that he could be pure? And he who was born of a woman that he could be righteous? See, if purification, right? Talking about purification. In the old King James it says clean there instead of pure. But they're both good words for this. Go on. If God puts no trust in his saints and the heavens are not pure in his sight, mm. how much less man who is abominable and filthy, who drinks iniquity like water. I, I apologize for liking that verse, but I, I do find, kind of find that bracing. Uh, human beings are abominable and filthy and they drink in iniquity, wickedness like, like water. And it's saying the rather shocking thing, doesn't it say that he puts no trust in his saints and the heavens are not pure or in the old King James, not clean in his sight? Uh, wow, if the heavens aren't, what hope is there for us? Uh, you know, how much more abominable and filthy is man who drinks in wickedness like water? Okay, that's a fun passage to read. Let's turn to the right and go to Psalm 51, shall we? Yeah, let's just read the beginning there. Oh, and read the little description at the top, right below where it says Psalm 51. Do you have that in your Bible, dear yep. reader? To the chief musician, a Psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. He did a bad, David had done a very, very bad. In fact, he managed at one time to break four of the commandments in one go <laughs> or something <laughs> uh, by lying and murdering and committing adultery and bearing false, you know, blah, 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 stealing and everything. So, uh, okay, so what does he say? What does he say after that? Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness. According to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Mm. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Let's hit pause for a second there. That is that David is asking God to wash him. Da David is saying, you wash me. It's a command. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. What does he say in that next verse? It's powerful. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. This whole thing is wonderful, but um, uh, look down at verse uh, 7. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. So this is God going to do all this washing. Look at verse 9. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. In verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a, f a steadfast spirit within me. Hmm. And let's go down, or just jumping all over the place, but go down to um, verse 17. This is more about sacrifices, and we may come back to this if we do the altar sometime. But The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. Oh, hmm. A broken and a contrite heart, these, O oh God, you will not despise. Yes, interesting. Okay, so he's confessing his sin and his iniquity and he's praying to the Lord to cleanse him. So that psalm would make you think, okay, the Lord washes us. Okay, go to the right and go to Isaiah, which comes up pretty soon, right in chapter 1. Some of you might already be thinking about this passage. Chapter 1, um, 
it starts with this sort of scathing thing about what are you doing giving me all these sacrifices in verse 11? Who required this of your hand? You know, I hate all this. Your hands are full of blood. And then in verse 16, this is the Lord speaking now. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Now, wait a minute. David said, you wash me. And God said, you wash yourself. Am I wrong? It seems like that's what he said, right? Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. How would we do that? Put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Hmm. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rebuke the oppressor. Defend the fatherless. Plead for the widow. And this amazing statement here. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Yes, we might as well stop there, but it's just, just beautiful. So the Lord is saying it is possible to get to a point where those sins are not active. They've completely changed color, so to speak. But we need to wash ourselves, make ourselves clean, put away the evil of our doings before the Lord's eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do good. Okay, um, uh, Isaiah 4, verse 4. What does that say? Isaiah 4, verse 4. When the, Lord when the Lord has washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion. Now wait, did the daughters of Zion wash the filth away from themselves? Well, that's not what I said. No, I said the Lord did. Wait a minute, now who does the washing? So, so the Lord... Hmm. David said the Lord does the washing and then the Lord said you wash yourself and then here it's just three chapters later it says oh the Lord when the Lord washes away that's right and it just goes on from there and it purged purged them in Jerusalem and so on okay let's uh, Jeremiah let's move on to the next book is Jeremiah let's go to Jeremiah chapter 2 Verses 20 to 22. 2, 20 to 22. For of old I have broken your yoke and burst your bonds. And you said, I will not transgress. When on every high hill and under every green tree you lay down playing the harlot. Hmm. Yet I had planted you a noble vine, a seed of highest quality. How then have you turned before me into the degenerate plant of an alien vine? Oh, lovely word, degenerate. Yes, go on. <laughs> For though you wash yourself with lye and use much soap, yet your iniquity is marked before me, mm. says the Lord God. Similar sort of passage about, yeah, you can, you, you can try, but you're not going to be able to get rid of that. You could, you could wash a lot, but your iniquity is marked before me. Uh, the Lord is speaking there to the church, to religious people and so on that, that about the disappointment. Uh, let's turn to the right. The next book is Ezekiel. Let's go to chapter 36. I'm just pulling out some passages about washing and so on, as we usually do to try to get a feel for what's going on here. The Lord is talking here in Ezekiel 36. Let's start at verse uh, 24 about gathering all the people back. They've been in exile now, and he wants to gather them all back into the Holy Land. And what is he going to do? For I will take you from among the nations, gather, gather you out of all countries, and bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you. Oh, so who's going to do the washing? The Lord. The Lord is going to do the washing. I'll sprinkle clean water on you and... And you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Mm. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. So this gives you some idea of what that cleansing is, right? It really is a cleansing of the spirit. You've got a new heart uh, uh, and, and a new spirit. And look down in verse 29 there. I will deliver you from all your uncleannesses. Yes, look at that. The Lord will deliver. So he's really the one who does this washing. 
And then how will we feel? Look at verse 31. Then you will remember your evil ways and your deeds that were not good, and you will loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and your abominations. It's sort of like David in Psalm 51, who's saying, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm full of sin, I've done wrong. And, and so it's interesting that after the Lord has cleaned us, then we will dislike ourselves because of the way we used to be. It's interesting, you know, that, that we'll, be, we'll be, what did David say? My sin is ever before me. And uh, it goes on from there. It's just a fabulous passage, but we don't have time to read that. And let's go to, um, well, why don't you go to Matthew and then just back up to Malachi, which is right before Matthew. And uh, chapter 3. This is not specifically about washing, but it is about purification. These first three verses in Malachi 3. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like launderer's soap. Soap. Mm. He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. Mm. He will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. Interesting again that you get washing and then offering, don't you? Or refining and then offering that, that he'll purify them as gold and silver and then they'll make this better kind of offering because they washed first. So to me, in the face of just those passages that we've read, and there are many, many more, um, you get a sense that this labor is not just about physical cleanliness before you perform a ceremonial act. You know, Scripture is showing that this is, this is about the cleansing of the spirit in some way. And yet, what, is ex what exactly is it talking about? And... Um, Oh, there's so many wonderful passages, but, but I want to talk about these now. Let's, let's talk about things a little bit, shall we? Um, Swedenborg says a remarkable thing about this. Let me get an illustration out here. Another illustration. For those of you who are just getting the audio, I've got a picture. It may be too small for those of you in the back of the room, but I've got a laver on this side that has two sort of basins and then it's sitting on a pedestal has water in the bottom, water in the top for washing the hands and for washing the feet. On the right hand side, I have something I'll talk about in a minute that is quite cryptic. And so the, the, uh, here's what Swedenborg says the laver mean. I was, I was really struck by this. I figured that because the laver was outside the tent of meeting, it had something to do with our outer self because generally the stuff in the tent of meeting is a picture of our inner self. And we talked about the, you know, the table of showbread as like being an awareness of the presence of the Lord in your heart and an, an awareness in your mind of the presence of the Lord in the lampstand. But now we're in the outer self, so the labor has something to do with washing and repentance and purification of the outer self. What Swedenborg said about this surprised me a little bit. It's not completely the opposite of what I was thinking, but he says, the laver is your outer self. It's not a part of it. It is a picture of your outer self and your outer self under a specific condition. The top basin is a picture. It, the water that it holds is divine truth. That won't surprise some of you uh, that Swedenborg's way of understanding water and there are many passages about this. You can, you can see it after a while when you read them. That water means divine truth, specifically the divine truth of the word. So these are teachings from the word about what we need to do to be a better person. And the top and the bottom, the, the bottom, uh, the washing of the feet corresponds to the cleansing of the outer self. But wait a minute, you just said the labor 
is the outer self, but the bottom of the laver is for cleansing the outer self, and the top of the laver, which is your outer self, is for cleansing your inner self. That's why it's two layered. Now what? What is going on? What do you mean? What do you mean that that this is our outer self and that and yet it's for how can your outer self cleanse your inner self? Your inner self is something the way Swedenborg describes it a lot of the time. It's not even something we're conscious of most of the time while we're alive in this world. We don't know what there are blessings going on in there. Remember, if some of the, those of you who heard the talk about the uh, table of showbread, you know, there, there are blessings in there that can't even be described, you know, that are going on inside your inner self. So how would you, how is the outer self, it seems like the wrong part. Shouldn't the inner self be cleansing itself and shouldn't the inner self be cleansing the outer self? Why would you use the outer self to cleanse the outer self and use the outer, to cleanse itself, it's like boot, bootstrapping yourself up, and to cleanse the inner self as well. What is going on? Well, the obvious analogy, good friends, is a swimming pool. And that's what I have on the right here in this illustration. It's a cross section of a swimming pool. And I was thinking about, not all pools are exactly the same, but this is like a basic principle. If you had a swimming pool, full of water and you need to cleanse that water. Because if you just leave it stand there, it's gonna get you know, stagnant and it's gonna be bad algae, it's gonna bloom, whatever, all kinds of stuff, and it's gonna be bad. So you need to purify it. You need to purify that body of water that you've got there. So how do you do it? Well, you need really basically two things. You need a skimmer, what's called a skimmer at the level of the top of the water. Why do you need a skimmer? Oh, that's because the top of the water gets all sorts of junk on it. You know, dead insect bodies and leaves and all kinds of things just accumulate on the top of your pool. And so they hook up this tricky thing that's a little lower than the water level so that it just naturally goes right in there and then it can skim the stuff off the top. You know, you don't even have to do it yourself. It will just, it'll just skim it off the top. Ah, but what about all the rest of the, you know, it's a tiny bit of the water that's on the top. What about all the rest of that water? Oh, well then you've got a drain thing down here. You know, that's the technical pool man term for it. Drain, drain thingy, I think is the accurate term. And, um, mm -hmm. and water goes down by water pressure down at the very bottom. So you take the lowest part of the pool to get the water and you bring it down and, and you take it up by the force of this pump and you bring it up to the same place, it usually in, uh, you know, comes into the same spot as the skimmer does. And both of them go through a, a basket with a big mesh. Why do they go through a basket with a big mesh? Because you wanna catch leaves, you wanna, you know, there's leaves at the bottom of the pool, that any kind of junk that's left in there, somebody's goggles, whatever, you know, if it goes down in here, it'll come up and end up in that basket. And that's just one stage of filtration in that basket and then it goes back to the pool filter back here, uh, which is running it through diatomaceous earth or whatever medium you have, and returns the water to the pool like this. It is striking to me, this is an upside down version of the laver. Like if you think of ourselves, our whole selves, the self that we can't see, we're like an iceberg, right? There's a whole, the biggest part of us is something we're not conscious of and we don't see. And uh, so it's like we're this body of water and then there's a surface of the water that people can see. But you need something that can take both stuff right off the top, skim it off the top and off the very bottom and pull it in and run it through a filtration to purify it. So this filtration over here is your lower self. And why do we need our lower self to do that purification? It's just upside down from the labor, but it's the same kind of picture in my mind. And um, uh, you need it in the outer self to purify your inner self because you can't, you can't see it. Like it's not like, oh, I have this in my inner self. Oh, you do? You know, I mean, don't people say I saw your aura and your aura is ugly or so, you know, like I, we, we can't see those things about ourselves, you know, 
uh, how are you going to purify that? Doesn't it have to manifest? So doesn't something have to manifest in yourself before you can see it? Now, I want to explain something else, very, very important, which is that Swedenborg says that this labor, you notice in the story of the children of Israel, if you're familiar with that, they were in slavery. They were in bondage in Egypt. And things were very, very bad. And their slavery was getting worse and worse and worse. It was really terrible. And then the Lord had Moses go and say, let my people go. And there's a long process. And they get out. They wander through the wilderness. And then they go to Mount Sinai. And they get these instructions for how to have a labor. Swedenborg says that means a really basic kind of regeneration has already happened. In other words, you are reborn. I don't know if you've had friends or you've been such a person yourself, friends, who like got into something like a 12-step program or something like that, and you used to be acting out or something, and now your life is very different. And you may still know that you're an addict inside or, or an alcoholic or whatever it is, but you're, you're, light, you're clothed and in your right mind. You know, I mean, it's, it's just a big change. That's a kind of rebirth. And that's what it means. That's one, one example of what it means when you come from Egypt and you get out into the wilderness and you're wandering to make your way to the Holy Land. You've already been reborn. You've already been through repentance. You've already been through some regeneration. You know, you've sort of started your life over again. Your you version 2.0, you know. And uh, then your outer self becomes an engine of purification. Now, this is amazing to me. Because when you're in Egypt, your outer self is your problem. I mean, that is the entirety of your problem. What your outer self wants, the flesh pots of, you know, don't they go on and on and there about the leeks and the cucumbers and the onions and all these wonderful the fish that they used to eat down in Egypt. It, it's, it, there's all these pleasures and things, and that's what you're addicted to. That's what's enslaving you, you know? Uh, your outer self was a major problem when you were in Egypt. That's what was holding you enslaved. Uh, that was causing all these problems. And so you're trying in every possible way to get away from those influences from your lower self. The things that your lower self desires are just not good. It's, it's self-centered. It's greedy. It wants better for yourself than for others. Uh, it's just interested in indulgence and pleasure and, and, and whatever. You, you know it very well, friends. And um, how amazing then is it not to say that that same device called your outer self is going to be in its entirety the machine that cleans you it is designed as a washing machine. It's designed as a filtration system. Now, any of you who may or may not have owned pools, have you ever gone and looked in that basket? There's a bunch of junk that <laughs> gets in that basket, right? That basket gets a lot of junk. Sometimes you have a really, really big storm and it washes half your gardens right into your pool then you, you've got you know, mulch and all, all, you know, all kinds of stuff in there. It's ripping the basket. You dump it out, put it, buy a new basket, stick it in there. So when you are a filter, you get full of junk. And I'm expressing it politely. This is a family show. But you get full of junk when you are a filter, right? That's your job. That's your job. You're a filter. So it was interesting that it was saying, lay apart all filthiness, you know, and, and all that wickedness and overflow of wickedness or whatever it's, a, you know, lay, lay that aside. Your outer self, Swedenborg uses this glorious Latin word that I can't resist using, a purificata, purificatorium. That's what your outer self is. It's, it's a place, an auditorium is a place where you hear things. A purificatorium is a place where <laughs> purification occurs. And you are wearing a purificatorium. If you've been through any sort of rebirth or started your life over again, 
This is what your outer self is. And it's a purificatorium not only for your outer self, but for your inner self, for the stuff that's deep and hidden within you. Because you don't know. I mean, do you, you have the experience sometimes, friends, you, you realize you're, the, the first you realize you're anxious is because your solar plexus is going insane, you know, or something. <laughs> or, or the first you realize you're mad or something, you know, your breathing has changed. Like it shows up in the outer self. And then you become aware of, oh, oh, I think I'm really angry right now. Thank you. You know, there that, that came out on the surface. Now, doesn't this explain a few things? Like, first of all, it's interesting. It might be a little discouraging. Uh, there's this wonderful, glorious idea, uh, falsity, uh, circulating in Christianity that it can be an instant. You are instantly cleansed. Whoa, wow. Poo. Oh, okay. Uh, instantly cleansed. How, how wonderful would that be? You know, well, that's not what the Bible's talking about. It's saying you, you don't even get a laver till after you've already been through this major rehaul of your life, overhaul of your life. And then this follows you all through the wilderness. And, in, you know, that, there's constant purification. What did he say? Job 15, 15. It's easy to remember, right? Job 15, 15. He puts no trust in his saints and the heavens are not pure in his sight. The heavens are still going in there and washing their hands and washing their feet. It keeps going. The Lord said, though your sins be as scarlet, they'll be as white as snow. Tell me, friends, do you think that happens quickly or slowly? Have you ever committed a sin? I hope not. How's that going for you? Is that all the way white yet? Or is it still a little pink or something? You know? It takes a while to get all the way to white as snow from where you started. It's scarlet. It, it takes a few washings. You know, the Lord wants to purify us is, in this way. Is the he capitalized in that sentence? Is the he yes. man or the Lord? That's the Lord. Because in the, in the Bible, it's not capitalized. Yeah. It, it's, I believe it's God, at least that's the way Swedenborg reads it, that, that, that he, God puts no trust in his saints and the heavens are not pure in his sight. I think it must be God because he's above the heaven, you know, from his perspective, even the heavens are not, are not pure. And um, so I just found this a really stunning idea that this same outer self that causes us so much heartache and trouble you know, it's like having an ill-trained dog that keeps biting people when you're talking to them or something. Um, it causes so much difficulty to think that that very thing could turn around and be your purification. So one thought that emerges from this is that it's not a one and done. It's not like, you know, get baptized, get saved, boom, you're done, boom, so totally clean, boom. Right? The labor shows that this is an ongoing process of washing. Um, it also under, it helps me understand why there's just so much junk buildup in the outer self. <laughs> like if you are a filter for all the vastness of your inner self, no wonder there's a, some accumulation of detritus. Right? And things that need to be laid aside and, and, and cleansed because you are the drain in some glorious shower, you know. And so, you know, stuff accumulates in there. And every so often you get a hanger and pull the rat out and put your gloves on, throw it in the trash. Uh, uh, this is what our outer self is there to be performing for us. And... Uh, so we should not be discouraged. Like if you've made that basic switch, you know, if you left your Egypt and you're not there anymore, even if you're starving and you're complaining in the wilderness or whatever, if you've done that, you may start to find that your outer self functions as this laver. That it didn't used to be there. It didn't used to be purifying you. It was getting you in trouble. But now it turns around to where this thing is purifying you, not only on the outside, but on the inside. I find that really amazing. Let's read a few passages with this in mind. Why don't we go to Mark in the New Testament? It's the second gospel in there. Mark chapter 7. 
Hmm. Oh, let's look at the first few verses in there. Then the Pharisees and some of the scribes came together to him, having come from Jerusalem. Now when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, that is, with unwashed hands, they found fault. Oh. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands in a special way, holding the tradition of the elders. Mm. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other things which they have received and hold, like the washing of cups, pitchers, copper vessels, and couches. Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? He answered and said to them, Well, well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, <laughs> as it is written, the pe this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men, the washing of pitchers and cups, and many other such things you do. Yes. And let's skip over to verse 14 because the, the discourse continues here. When he had called all the multitude to himself, he said to them, Hear me, everyone, and understand, there is nothing that enters a man from outside which can defile him. But the things which come out of him, those are the things that defile a man. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. When he had entered a house away from the crowd, his disciples asked him concerning the parable. So he said to them, Are you thus without understanding also? Do you not perceive that whatever enters a man from outside cannot defile him? Because it does not enter his heart, but his stomach, and is eliminated, thus purifying all foods. Hmm. And he said, What comes out of a man, that defiles a man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile a man. Yes, so you want to um, uh, be laying those things aside. A part of the image of the water is the image of truth, truth from the Word. One of the most important things that truth can do is to show us, as it just did there, to say, this is what, is, this is what evil is. This is evil. That's good. Without that, how are we going to be purified? That's what the water is. You don't wash in dust or something else. It's the, it's the truth that helps you see, oh, that's not good. Oh, I shouldn't be doing that, you know, and helps you do that, do that purification. Um, let's look at... Um, Let's go into the epistles here. So go through Acts and Romans, turning to the right. And I want to get to um, 2 Corinthians. comes up right after Romans and 1 Corinthians, chapter 7, verse 1. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. Mm. Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. See, I like that flesh and spirit. I think that's the outer self and the inner self. You know, that's what we're... And who's doing the washing? Let us cleanse ourselves. We Cleanse are. ourselves. So we, you know, this is the mystery, I think, is that only the Lord can cleanse us from evil, and yet we have to do something or He's not going to do it. And so we do the, the cleansing. The image of the priests being the ones who are washing their hands is interestingly in a kind of reverse imagery. Uh, it's the Lord cleansing us. They, like they, they represent the Lord cleansing us. One other point about the bronze is that the bronze means good actions on the outer level of your life. Like it's so foundational to the whole thing. And as you do good things for others, these are good works. This isn't some celestial holy love inside, you know, deep within yourself. These are good actions on the outside. That's what that bronze is. And uh, this is so basic to it. And this is what holds that truth. 
And this is what teaches it. This is what is a mirror to us. As you're doing things for others, you start to understand, oh, this is good. That's evil. This is self-centered. You know, it's through that process that we start to understand what the truth is and, and how to be. Let's turn to the right from there, shall we? And go to Ephesians chapter 5. So you go through Galatians and get to Ephesians. Mm. And this is a very interesting, it even calls it straight up a mystery. But look at verse 25 and starting. Remember when we were reading before about how the Lord is going to sprinkle clean water it was likening the church to a woman or something, and the Lord was going to do this cleansing and so on. Let's see what we've got here in Ephesians 5, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. Oh, you see, you might think it's physical water, but he says by the word, right? It's, it's right there the washing of water, by the word. The word is what's going to do this by understanding, oh, that's good. This is what loving the neighbor is. This is what loving the Lord is. That's what evil from hell is. You know, we need the word to tell us those things. We get all turned around in our heads. That's what helps us get clean. And then in verse 27, that he might present her to himself a glorious church. And now who's doing the washing here? Uh, verse 26. 26, he might sanctify and cleanse her. He is. That's the Lord. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes it's us, sometimes it's the Lord. Okay, good. And then what is this church going to be like after this nice cleansing? And not having spot or wrinkle or mm. any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. And look at verse 32. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Yeah, that's what he's talking about, Christ and, Christ and the church. So he's framing it in sort of a husband and wife setting or something, but he's really talking about Christ and the church. Uh, let's turn to the right, go through Philippians and Colossians and First and Second Thessalonians. I want to get to 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy 2, verse 20. Okay, sorry, I was doing something. Second Timothy 2, verse 20, got it. Mm -hmm. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful, useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Mm. Flee. Yes. Now, who is doing the purging there? Who, who does if the cleansing? If anyone cleanses himself, us. It yourself. Yeah. Yeah. You have to do it. Both are true. You have to do it for yourself, and only the Lord can do it. And go on. We get some nice little advice on what that might mean. Flee also youthful lusts, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Uh, uh, what kind of heart? Pure. Oh, a pure heart. Wouldn't that be great? And turn to the right. You'll go through Hebrews and get to James again. And I want to go to James chapter 4, verse 8. Oh, we've got to do 7. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. And purify your hearts, you double-minded. Isn't that nice? Cleanse your hands. Isn't this? Like cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts. Here it's almost like the hands and feet have now become, you know what I mean? They become the hearts and the hands or something. But, but cleanse your hands. And who's doing that cleansing? We are. We are. Yeah. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Yes, there are many other wonderful uh, passages. Um, uh, have we covered all the imagery here? The bronze, the mirrors. The mirror is like self-examination, is it not? And it's a way that as you look down in your outer self, don't you see things like you think, ooh, that's junky. That was selfish or, hmm, that, you know, like you, you see things. 
I think that's like the mirror. The, the whole thing is made of mirrors. It's really amazing to me that it's made of mirrors. And so that's part of the purification is self-examination, being aware of ourselves. This is not the Lord. It's not punitive. It's not like the Lord saying, oh, you're so disgusting. You've got to clean yourself up or something like that. This is a great kindness that the Lord says, let me, let me help you. I, I want to help you. And this, it's a simple image of the labor, but I want to go back to something that was said in Exodus 30, right at the beginning there. Didn't it say something like, this is a statute forever throughout all your generations or some, something like that? Uh, this purification is, is ongoing in, into eternity. And we're going to get real happy about it. We might not be happy about it now, but we're going to get really, really happy about this over time because it's a, it's a purification. And, and the heavens are not done yet, but they're still, they're happily going along. They're doing the cleansing. Every time they go into the tabernacle of meeting, every time they go to offer something on the altar, they're washing, cleansing, purifying the inside, purifying the outside. The Lord has given us this wonderful way. And so this is about a purification. You go through that basic getting out of Egypt where you kind of your whole life changes. Can you imagine you've been in slavery in Egypt and you're living that whole life and other people are bringing you food and telling you what to do and all that stuff. All of a sudden you're on your own. You're camping. You're all out in the wilderness. All the rules have changed. You got to be your own army and you know, it's, it's a huge upheaval to make that initial shift. But what starts to happen is that your outer self turns into this engine, this filter that is cleansing, cleansing bit by bit by bit. You know, when, when you have a pool, like you'll run that filter 12 hours a day when the, when the sun is up because those microbes are wanting to get going. So keep, keep running the filter, keep running the filter, keep washing, keep washing. You get get purified. It really blew my mind to realize, oh, this is not about repentance. This is after repentance. And uh, it's our whole self, our whole outer self, our conscious outer self that participates in this dual cleansing. So the way I would summarize all this is as follows. Before we are reborn, our outer self is a liability and a cause of many problems. Afterwards, though, it becomes an asset because it is a filter for purifying our spirit. And this explains why we find so much junk in it sometimes. Thank you for your kind attention, good friends. And let's close with a fervent prayer. <laughs> Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, you came down into this world. You became the embodiment of that tabernacle. You made that turn. Your outer self became a filter for cleansing everything that was human in you to such a point that you were so purified you became divinity itself. Please help us in our purification, Lord. Do not stop this process partway through or put it into reverse. Keep us going, Lord. Encourage us. Encourage us. Remind us that sometimes what we're seeing that we think is so bad is stuff on its way out. It's not stuff that needs to trouble us in exactly that same way anymore. We thank you for the for your divine ability, for your truth that purifies us, and for your ability to wash us, to cleanse us, to make us whole, and the joy. Introduce us, Lord, into the joy of a never-ending process, little bit by little bit, getting cleaner and cleaner in your sight. Our Father, who art in the heavens, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. 
thy will be done, as in heaven, so upon the earth. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's keep on purifying, friends. It'll be fun. Fun. <laughs> <laughs>